Hello, I'm Lauren and welcome to Improving the World. I'm an international improviser based in Hong Kong and I talk to amazing women of improv all over the world. Today I talk to Coco Galore. She is a Toronto, Canada based improviser and we speak about your perspective. What does that mean in improv? All the stuff that you did, that you saw, that you experienced, how that has shaped your perspective and how that then weaves into the improv world for what you do on stage and how people perceive you. I hope that you enjoy. Hello. <laughs> how you doing? I'm good. So you are an improviser, comedian. You are also right now the interim artistic and managing director, thank you very much, dual title of Bad Dog Theater there in Toronto. So I am. <laughs> we are gonna talk today about perspective in improv and I'm gonna get us there. But I think this is beautiful to hear because you're an artistic director. Tell me what you deem, Coco, as really great improv. What's the stuff that just speaks to you? Oh, wow. It speaks to me, my heart. So first of all, there's two things. I think there's a difference between what majority audience will appreciate, like, versus what I personally <laughs> like. I'm a bit of a book nerd, as you can see. But for me, really great improv is a merge of the two, pop culture and truth telling, truth and storytelling. I think it's so important for art in every form to reflect what's going on in humanity, inside, in our mental perspectives, spiritual perspectives, etc. If you look back historically, all art has always told us what was going on in history. You were mentioning two different things there. You were talking about what the populist audience is really into and what floats your boat. And so you're mentioning history and nerdy book cool stuff. The reason why I mentioned history and stuff is because I just think all great art reflect what's going on in society right now. I think popular culture is part of that, but there's also this more underlying perspective that's also happening in humanity. For me, great art is the merge of the two. It's the merge of what a lot of people will intake and also understand that it is a reflection of what's going on deeper inside. And I like to apply that to improv <laughs> because improv is art. <laughs> yeah, in improv, we're often doing characters and I want to know in terms of really great character work, where do you think that lies? And more specifically, that place whereby one is being a character and one is being oneself. Because if to your point, you're really being reflective of what's going on, that's the now, the present, your realities, your experiences, that's about me. And then the character might be referencing that. Where do they merge or find difference? <laughs> If we're talking about improv, not a character that's well thought out, a sketch or whatever, the lines blur pretty quickly. You come up with a character for whatever your reasons, whether it is something that you saw in somebody else or the popular thing is to pick one quality and then amplify that. Eventually what does happen is you start bleeding into it because at the end of the day, you are still embodying somebody else through your eyes. So how does this person shop that's still through your eyes? Especially if you play the scene very grounded, your truths and your instincts come out naturally. Things from your gut comes out into the scene and you want to say things. An example that my improv partner, Daphne, so we're Coco and Daphne, that we like to use is we'll play scenes where one of us will be a racist character. One of us will be a misogynist character. Of course, neither one of us are misogynistic or racist, but what we do is we fuel the character by speaking from kind of like the reverse. What are the things that we've heard that said to us? And how did it make us feel at the time? And then playing the character through that. So that is still my truth. If I play a racist or a misogynist character, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, I'm saying something that I have heard to me or to somebody else. So that is still my perspective. It's just something mm -hmm. that I've seen. I want to ask about and maybe challenge something that you said. You were talking about an improv character maybe not being thought out, but then as you talked about a really great character, you said that maybe it's fueled by these personal experiences. So might I challenge and say that if you are being truthful and doing a really great character, it is therefore really thought out. It might be instantaneous and spontaneous, crafted in the moment. But if it's rooted in truth, does that mean that it is deep and thought out? Or do you think it can't be because that would take planning? No, 
I don't think that it can't be. I specifically meant that it wasn't something that you took the time to think about and write it out. I was really just trying to draw a distinction between a monologue that you've had time to prepare or mm -hmm. a sketch character yeah. versus instinctually. However, I think you make such a great point when you say that if your authenticity is driving it, especially if it's something that you have experienced mm -hmm. and that you know about, you've had time to think about this, right? Like I've had time to think about what a misogynistic man, how they make me feel. I've had time to think about that a lot of times. So. <laughs> Unfortunate time to think, yes. Yeah, so in that way, yes. Yes. Shifting gears. You got into short form a little bit later than long form. And I point this out and I want to query this because many people start with short form, not to say that it is any way lesser, hear me internet not saying that. It is potentially something quicker to pick up and we've seen in media a little bit more. What was the sexy short form draw that got gotcha? you? So this is funny because of course we all started in short form and then as soon as I discovered long form I was like ah, bye <laughs> and I just went into that yeah. for a really long time and then I got reintroduced to short form when I joined the Bad Dog Theater as a featured player and I had this instructor for a month Gavin Williams he was teaching us theater sports and stuff like that the way that he presented it really made me enjoy it because theater sports for anybody who doesn't know it's basically a competitive short form show and talking about the winning and the losing and the art of it the art of losing gracefully and serving the audience like you're almost apologetic to the audience and I was like what I was just pissed off at losing <laughs> I was like, oh man, he's like, no, it doesn't matter if you win or lose. It's not about that. It's about serving the audience. And so when he kind of instilled that in me, it made me enjoy short form and specifically theater sports a lot more because then it made me realize, oh, it's not even about whether I win or lose. And some people take that very seriously. I've seen people leave stage with tears. It made me shift gears and really appreciate short form. Yeah. When you say serving the audience, do you just mean like serving up quality and making sure that we are crafting a crispy, beautiful, ironed product? Or is it about something else? What does it mean serving the audience? I mean, yes. I think serving the audience is remembering, and I think sometimes performers forget this, you're improvising for an audience. Mm -hmm. So it has to be enjoyable for the people that are sitting there watching the show, particularly if you're asking people to hand over money. <laughs> like, that is important. <laughs> First of all, there's so little money in improv as an improviser. Think about how it feels for you to have to spend 10, 15, 20 dollars on anything. I think sometimes we forget that. And that's something that I really learned coming up. And I would say I really got polished through Julie DeMay Osborne at Bad Dog Theater. She's, oh God, she's the former artistic director, but also a really good friend of mine. And she really taught us the polish of improv, how to dress, how to host, all of those things for an audience. And even if your audience is an audience of four, that's what it's for. I've done it and I've seen people be like, yeah, hey, what's going on? Um, yeah, so, and an inside joke, inside joke, inside joke. And the audience is like, what did I just, what? I don't want to pay for this. Mm. Yeah, I have seen an improv show where the group had a list of games on a piece of crumply paper and then the host turned their back to the audience to lean over and look at the list and be like, ah, uh, what's next? Oh yeah, this one. And I was aghast in my seat that they were just like ignoring yeah. us to check their crumpled paper. I was like, you, you don't know the next one? You gotta look and turn your back to me? I was- Or do it subtly, right? Like, hey, what's going on? Okay, all right, next up we got, I don't know. And I think a lot of people forget that. I would say that those six months of training as a bad dog feature player really, really honed that skill and really made me think of it so differently. Bonus side note question that I just thought of. In Bad Dog Theater, because I've never been there, do you ever get to say Bad Dog? Is it uh, integrated in the shows or do you ever have taglines with Bad Dog or do you kick off a player and go, Bad Dog? Do you ever get to say it? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Opportunity, miss. I haven't seen any shows that anybody has, but maybe, maybe people do it. <laughs> I would be punning like crazy in show intros and stuff. <laughs>
if you need if you need any anything i'm i'm here for you speaking of the theater you as we said right now you're the artistic director you're crafting the showmanship and this awareness of the audience now as an artistic director how do you see perspectives what's that mean to you and the evolution and where we're going with this Yeah, so everybody who knows me knows this perspective and authenticity is probably most important. And that's the kind of work that I like generally across the board. To me, that's what drives art. And I think what's really important is I would like to think, especially as a Black queer woman, I would like to think that collectively we are tired of one perspective. We are tired of two or three perspectives that we've just been getting over and over. And we get it, you're funny. You're funny. You've written all the TV shows. You've gotten all the sitcoms. It's great. And I think that we need more. And I'm not just talking about as artists. It's also the audience wants more. So the audience wants more, but they don't quite know what they want. We have to serve it. It's not just about having physical representation. And that's why I like to use the word perspectives, because I think oftentimes when we think of inclusion and diversity, we only think of what someone looks like. That is important because I think visual representation is important. I think also perspective representation is even more important. For example, me and Daphne, Coco and Daphne, we are two Black queer women, but we come from such different backgrounds. When people are just like, oh, we just need a Black woman, and they pick either one of us, it's like, you're not going to get the same thing. It's not the same thing. Question, have, has anyone uttered the sentence, I just need a Black woman? Do you hear that? I just need I mean, a Black I've, woman. I've never heard that because okay. I've I am the black woman, so I don't think that they'll be like, hey, black girl, I need another black girl. No, they'll never say that to me. There's microaggressive ways that people say it, right? And there's microaggressive ways that people do it. And you can see it in the patterns that people have used to cast. What's really sad, it erases people's multi-dimensional humanity in a way because mm-hmm. I am not just a black woman first of all I'm mixed race things like that so my perspective is not the same as Daphne for that reason but for other multitude of reasons mm-hmm. that's not even being heard because it's just well we just need a black girl it's for every single one of us not just black folk it's for every perspective that's not being heard i directed a show called love the whole reason for the cast and how i can pick the cast was specifically because i had seen inklings of their other work and what i thought they could bring to the table in regards to what they thought about love specifically that's so much more interesting to me and how i then see them drive the scenes based on what I know that they think about. And it was so interesting to the audience. I directed two in Vancouver and five in Toronto. Every time there's at least one or two people that leave go like this. (laughs) And I'm like, yes, yes, this is what I want. (laughs) I remember telling the cast, just be authentic and play the scene real. The comedy will come in between the lines. Everybody's trained. We're funny. We don't need to throw a scene under the bus in order to be funny. The other thing is that people laugh at things that sometimes you don't even think it's funny. Like, you know what I mean? When people play scenes very real, people will laugh. Yeah. (laughs) I'm thinking like 7,000 things right now. I want to come back to just the word itself perspective because I think that when people hear that word, they think certain things and the way that you're articulating it is potentially unique for some. So what we're talking about is, so I mean, I found this photo because I searched the word perspective. So this is about distance and seeing things from like a different angle, right? Having perspective, the way that something is viewed or can be viewed, someone can be viewed. But also I'm hearing you talk about the way that someone views, not just the way that you are seen, but the way that you see what it is that you are bringing, the truth that you then tell when you come to that character work and the improv and so on. It's about what you saw. And you were saying that you are different than someone else who maybe looks the same as you, but that's funny because I'm thinking you would be identical twins and you'd still have a different journey and perspective. Exactly. I'll spend every Look second. Look like and Ashley. So different. <laughs> Thank you for the reference, yes. <laughs> no, they really are though, they really are. Like you can tell just from the way they dress that they see things differently. And because they see things differently, they've experienced life probably differently. The way you absorb things is different. And so you put it back out differently. It's just so much more interesting to see what that output is. 
from mm -hmm. different people, backgrounds, different, all of the checkpoints. That doesn't sound great, checkpoints. No, like, you know, actually, the way that you just articulated that you're kind of absorbing life and then reflecting it back, it made me almost think that, I mean, maybe I'm getting super referential here, but maybe the improviser or performer is almost just a mirror for whatever it is that they see. If I'm a kind human and doing a good job at performing, getting up on stage and being real, I'm just mirroring back and showing back what it is that was shown to me. So you were talking about your two-person show, your two-prov. You are being a character that is the opposite of you, almost the mirror of you, because you're just shining back what you experienced and saw. So you're just, you're just <laughs> being yeah. glass. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that what great art is, in my hmm. opinion? Not just improv, but all songs, et cetera, et cetera. The reason why it touches people is because it's something that they have seen or felt or understand. What's very unique about improv in the same way about improvised jazz is that it is in the moment. You don't get to be like, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. And even if you do that, we already heard what you just said. That's why I love that line. There are no mistakes. There are only gifts in improv. We all know now, all, you know, 15 of us in the room. Yeah. 10 of them being improvisers. I was just going to make that yes. <laughs> being like, hey, we all heard you say that. You're going to come back to it. It's just so cool because you get those moments to do it. It's in the moment. You never get to see that show again. A good friend of mine, Callum, said, it is both open and closing night of the show. And I love that line so much, and I use it all the time. He used it once, never used it again. And I use that line every time because I love it so much. Because fun. it's so true. Yeah. You will never see this again in the way that it is now. You think about it philosophically. This moment in time is all it is. That is so unique to improv. So we're talking about you being artistic director. And now that you have the ability, you're in a place where you can help craft the humans and the voices, which then articulate whatever it is they're going to shine back out. Now you're aware of the showmanship and the people paying and the whole thing and you're puppet mastering. Oh. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you think you are, but like I've decided you are. I so <laughs> you're, you're, you're up there blah, uh, doing this. I'm guessing this is a question. You're making sure that you are casting from a place of perspective. How do you do that? You have to see people perform their art. Do you have intense interviews? How do you make sure that you are having perspective representation that spans a buffet of experiences? I think the most important thing is to listen. Listen when people talk about themselves. A lot of times in improv, we do talk about even just hanging out, like uh, where we're from, what we've done, etc. and observe. That's something that we don't do all the time. I think a lot of people only think about themselves. And so they're very quick to just dismiss the experiences of other people. Whereas I love to be like, like, tell me more. Like, I want to see more. Why is this this little habit that you have? If we all did that more, we would be embracing each other a little bit more in terms of love and kindness. I always try to do it from that perspective. And if there are people that I haven't seen that I don't know, then I rely on everybody else to be like, hey, have you heard of this cool person? And mm -hmm. I might watch their work and see things. And it's funny because if you're watching a show with me, I will always be the person laughing in between the other laughs. <laughs> there are things that I find funny and unique that people do that other people are like, what's the big deal? And I'm like, that cool thing. <laughs> so you are that person, you know, when you're watching a comedy special or something and it becomes the dead silence and then there's the one laugh out there. That's yeah. you. That's me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a drama, a dramatic movie, but a theater. Mm -hmm. And then you'll just hear me start cackling. <laughs> Beautiful. Love it. All right, Coco. Tell me, please, if you would not mind, your words of wisdom. You're speaking to your improv community peers, the younger version of you, or someone who's never tried improv. They are curious. They saw this duck picture and they came to hear. What do you want them to know? So, so first of all, what about them ducks, eh? <laughs> I'm so into these what ducks. What do I want them to know about improv or? This is up to you. So here's the funny thing is I like to make a double reference. I like to make the reference of Clueless when they make the reference of Hamlet and oh. they say, to thy own self, be true. 
because I just love how in Clueless she knew, but then the girl was like, no, you're just a shopaholic. You don't know anything. And she's like, no, no, I know it because Mel Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> this is when we still were okay with Mel Gibson. Um, so I love that line, to thy own self be true. The other line that I love is Viola Davis. It's a quote that I put on all my social media. My authenticity is my rebellion. And I love that so much. As long as you are exploring yourself through your art and you're being as authentic as you can be. Because some people can't and some people are not there yet. We also have to respect that. We're not all philosophy majors or book nerds. As long as you're working from that space, I think the work can be really beautiful and reflective. To me, that's what makes really cool art. Hmm. Coco, if people want to come find you, they're in Toronto, come see a show, support Bad Dog, and find you in life and throw money at you, how oh, yeah. can they find you? I am at Coco Galore on all the platforms except for TikTok. I'm not on TikTok. <laughs> I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Coco Galore, C-O-K-O-G-A-L-O-R-E. My website is cococalore.com. You can always find my latest work, musings, pictures. I love taking pictures. Ooh. In Toronto, I'm at the Bad Dog Theater, and that's about it. Lovely. Well, thank you so very much. It was absolutely fantastic to get to hear from you and talk with you. Thank you for your time and your energy. Thank you for your time and your energy. Yes. All right, all. This is Improving the World, Duck Edition. Thank you for joining us. There's more where that came from. So, did you love the video? If you did, please say kind and beautiful things in the comments down below. And you could subscribe if you're feeling sassy. And look for more Improving the World. Thanks.